Hello and welcome to this Dr. Frost Maths video on Key Stage 5 Differentiating Trigonometric Functions. Now there's only two things that you actually need to remember here and all the rest we can derive from it. And that's when you differentiate sine of x, you get cos of x. And I proved that from first principles in another video. And then when we differentiate cos of x, we get minus sine of x. And I should point out, by the way, that x has to be in radians in order for sine of x to differentiate to cos of x. It doesn't work if you're in degrees. So when we're doing anything in calculus, we're always assuming uh, that any angle we have is in radians and not in degrees. And the way I remember these, by the way, is that I sort of picture sine above cos like that. And when you differentiate, you're sort of going downhill. When you integrate, you're going uphill. So we differentiate sine, we go to cos. When we integrate cos, we get to sine. But if we go the wrong way, then it actually negates it. So if we integrate sine, we're going the wrong way. So it actually becomes minus cos x. And similarly, if we differentiate cos x, it's going the wrong way. So it becomes minus sine of x. So let's use that for these first few questions. We want to differentiate firstly sine of x. Well, as I just said, that one is just cos of x. B, we've got cos of x. We already said that becomes minus sine of x. And then we've got sine of 3x. Now, in another video, I cover something called the chain rule. But without having to know the chain rule for the moment, um, there's a kind of standard rule here. If you differentiate sine of something x, where that something is a constant, then basically you just have to differentiate normally, but you have to times by whatever number is in front of that x. So we get cos of 3x, but we have to times by that 3 there. And then let's do that with these others. When we differentiate x squared minus cos of 5x, well, the x squared differentiates to 2x. Now, minus cos, when we differentiate it, well we, well, we know when we differentiate cos, it becomes a minus sign, so it negates it. So it's going to negate this to become positive, and the cos becomes sine of 5x. But, as we did above, because there's a number in front of the x, we have to times by that 5 to get positive 5 sine 5x. Just a few more of those. If we differentiate 5 sine x, now, in general, if we scale an expression, we also scale its derivative and its integral as well. So we know that sine of x differentiates to cos of x, and therefore 5 sine x will differentiate to 5 cos of x, because we've scaled it by 5. And then finally, f, we're differentiating 6 cos 3x. Now, we know that cos differentiates to minus sine, so we've got minus, and we've got the sine of the 3x. But as I said before, we have to times by that 3 in front of the x. So that 6 is going to get multiplied by the 3, so it's minus 18 sine 3x. What about question 2? A curve has equation y equals sine of 3x plus 2x. Find the stationary points on the curve in that particular interval, 0 to 2 thirds pi. Well, we know to find a stationary point, we have to differentiate and set that derivative equal to zero. So, if I just copy this, we differentiate with respect to x. So the sine 3x becomes 3 cos 3x, we times by that 3, and the 2x just differentiates to 2. And because it's a stationary point, we set dy of dx equal to 0, and now we just have to solve that equation. Well, let's try and get cos of 3x on its own. So if we minus the 2 and divide by 3, we get cos of 3x is minus 2 thirds. And then we're solving in radians, so we're going to put our calculator in radians mode. So we do inverse cos of minus 2 thirds, and that gives us 2.30. So 3x is equal to 2.30, but we need to get all the solutions between 0 and 2 thirds pi. Now, we should have really changed the range first. So if x is between 0 and 2 thirds pi, we're reasoning about 3x. So if we times that by 3, that's going to be between 0 and what's that times 3? Well, 2 pi. So we just need all solutions up to 2 pi. And note, by the way, we need to get all these different solutions before we divide by 3. 
So how do we get an extra solution for cos? Do you remember that you do 360 minus to get another solution for cos? And if it's in radians, well, that's 2 pi minus. So we just need to do 2 pi minus that solution there, and that gives us 3.98. And then at that point, we can then divide each of these by 3 to get our solutions. So if I divide that second solution by 3, I get 1.33. And if I divide this first one by 3, I get... 0.767 if it's to three significant figures. And by the way, it wants the full coordinates of these stage three points, so we need to find the y values as well. Now, y is sine 3x plus 2x, so we just need to take that value and plug it through this original equation. So if we do sine of 2 times that value, sine of 3 times that value, plus 2 times that value, that gives us 2.28. And if we do that, the same thing with the 1.33. So we do the sine of 3 times 1.33 plus 2 times 1.33. That gives you 1.91. And there we go. We've got our two stationary points, that point and that point. Now, if you haven't seen my chain rule video or studied the chain rule separately, I recommend you stop this video at this point, uh, go watch that video first, and then come back to the rest of this video, because I will assume that you do know this rule. So let's differentiate these other trig functions. We've got, firstly, tan of x. Now, I will actually prove this one, how you get the result, because you could be tested on this proof. And the way you do it is to write tan of x as sine of x over cos of x. And then, as we saw in the chain rule video, um, we saw something called the quotient rule, and that allows us to differentiate a division like this. So do you remember the quotient rule? If you had y equals u over v, so something over something, then the gradient function would be v du over dx minus u dv over dx all over v squared. So in this case, the u is the sine x, the v is the cos x, so we need du over dx is cos x, and we need dv over dx, which is minus sine x, and then we can just plug all of this stuff into the quotient rule. So dy over dx is v du over dx, so that times that, so that's cos squared x, minus, and then u dv over dx, so that times that is minus sine squared x, but we're minusing minus sine squared x, so that becomes a plus, and then all over v squared, so that's over cos squared x. Now, from our triggered identities, you should know that sine squared x plus cos squared x is 1, so we get 1 over cos squared x, and 1 over cos squared x is just sec squared x. So there we go, we get a standard result that tan of x differentiates to sec squared x. And you should just memorise that. It's unlikely they'll ask you to prove it, but I have seen it in an exam before. But you should just remember straight off that tan x differentiates to sec squared x. And you can state that without proof unless they explicitly ask. What about sec of x? Well, we can use a chain rule for this one. So we can write sec of x as 1 over cos of x, because that's what sec x means. And that allows us to write it as a power. So we could write this as cos of x to the power of minus 1. I should note, by the way, that's not the same as cos minus 1 of x, because that means inverse cos of x. And that's not what we mean here. This minus 1 here is a power, so it means 1 over cos of x. So we use a chain rule. Do you remember the chain rule? You look at the outer function first, so the outer function is something to the minus 1. I call it the blah rule. So blah to the minus 1 differentiates to minus blah to the minus 2. And then we differentiate the blah. So we times by that blah differentiated, cos x differentiated is minus sine x. Now notice that those minuses cancel, so we just get sine of x and then it's, because that's a power of minus 2, it's over cos squared x. Now, if we split that up as 1 over cos of x times by sine of x over cos of x, and that clearly works because cos x times cos x is cos squared x, 1 times sine x is sine of x, then we can write it in this nicer way. 1 over cos x is sec x, and sine x over cos x is tan of x. So there we go, we get this next standard result that sec of x differentiates to sec x tan x.
Now these other ones I'm not going to prove. Uh, I'm just going to state the result. So when you differentiate cosec x, now, the way I remember this one is that if you can remember that sec of x differentiates to sec x tan x, whenever you co the trig function, so instead of sec, I have cosec of x, then you also co each thing in the result, but you also have to negate it. So I'm going to negate it, and then instead of sec x, I have cosec x, and instead of tan x, I have cotan x, or just cot x. And that's the easy way to memorize that one. It's the same with cot. So do you remember that it's equivalent reciprocal function? So tan of x, we know, differentiates to sec squared of x. So because I code the tan, cotan of x, I have to code this result, but also negate it. So it becomes minus cosec squared of x. And that's how I remember that one. And then we can use the chain rule for these other ones. So if I differentiate tan of 4x... Well, the way the chain rule works is we initially differentiate the outer function. So tan of blah differentiates to sec squared of blah. But then you have to differentiate the inner function, the 4x, which is 4. So we times by 4. And then f, if I differentiate 5x, I initially differentiate the outer function. So sec of blah differentiates to sec blah tan blah. But I have to times by the inner function, the blah, differentiated, and that 5x differentiates to 5, so we times by 5. Now we're going to differentiate trig functions to a power. So, if we want to differentiate sine squared of x, the way we do it is to initially write what sine squared x means. So, sine squared x just means sine of x squared. That's what it means when we write that kind of notational convenience there. And that allows us to use the chain rule. So our outer function here is blah squared. Now blah squared differentiates to 2 blah. And then we times by the inner function, the blah differentiated, and sine x differentiates to cos x. And if you wanted to, you might notice that that is the double angle formula for sine of 2x. So we could write it more conveniently like that. So it's quite amusing that that little 2 there as a power actually kind of moves down to the x to become a bigger 2 when you differentiate it. And that's just a coincidence. What about b? When we differentiate cos squared 3x, we can do exactly the same thing. So we have to just write the squared outside of the trig function. So it's cos of 3x squared. And then we just use the chain rule again. So blah squared, the outer function, differentiates to 2 blah. And then we have to times by the inner function differentiated. Well, the cos of 3x initially becomes minus sine 3x. But because of the chain rule, we have to times by that 3 there as well. So it becomes this. And if you write that more simply, it's minus 6 sine 3x cos 3x. And again, if you want to be really clever, you could use a double angle formula here to spot that this could be written like that. But that's quite advanced up. And then what about this last one? I want to differentiate sec squared 3x. Well, I do exactly the same thing. I write that squared outside the sec 3x and then use the chain rule. So blah squared becomes 2 blah. And then the sec 3x, the inner function, differentiates to 3 sec 3x tan 3x. Remember that we have to times by that 3 inside because of the chain rule. We're actually using the chain rule twice here. And then if we write that in a simpler way, 2 times 3 is 6. We have sec 3x times sec 3x, which is sec squared 3x. And then we've also got that tan 3x. Now finally, we're effectively differentiating inverse trig functions here because if x is equal to tan y, now that's the same as saying y is equal to inverse tan of x. They won't explicitly ask you to differentiate inverse trig functions in an exam, but they might write it in this way and you have to do the rest of the work. Now we want to find dy over dx, but we have x in terms of y. And I've explored in another video, I think the chain rule video, that if we've got x in terms of y, we initially find dx over dy, and then we can reciprocate it to find dy over dx. So, 
if x is equal to tan y, then we differentiate both sides. So we get dx over dy because we've got x in terms of y rather than y in terms of x. And tan y we know becomes set squared y. But we want to find dy over dx. So do you remember that you just reciprocate both sides? So the set squared y becomes 1 over set squared y. But it wants dy over dx in terms of x, not in terms of y. So somehow we have to get this set squared y in terms of x. Now we know that x is tan y, so is there something that relates tan of y and set squared y? Well indeed there's an identity. Do you remember that 1 plus tan squared y is equal to set squared y? And that means this set squared y here can be replaced with 1 plus tan squared y. But tan of y is x, so tan squared of y must be x squared, so we get 1 over 1 plus x squared, and there we go. That is dy of dx in terms of x. Let's try that with the second one. We've got x is sine y. Let's do the same thing we did before. Differentiate with respect to y, because we've got x in terms of y. Well, sine y differentiates to cos of y. And then we reciprocate both sides. So dy of dx is equal to 1 over cos y. You might be tempted to write sec of y, but that's going to make it difficult to write in terms of sine y. So we've got cos y, but we want to have sine y so we can get x into this expression here. Now, is there some identity that relates sine of y and cos y? Well, yes. We know that sine squared y plus cos squared y is equal to 1. And therefore, if we make cos of y the subject, because that's what we need to find, if we subtract the sine squared y, we get cos squared y is 1 minus sine squared y, and therefore cos of y is just the square root of that, so the square root of 1 minus sine squared of y. So therefore this thing here is equal to 1 over cos y, which we said was the square root of 1 minus sine squared y, and because x is equal to sine y, we get 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And there we go. And finally, this last part of 5, we've got x is equal to sec 3y. So we do exactly the same thing as we did before. We find dx over dy. And using the chain rule, sec of blah becomes sec blah tan blah. But we have to times by that blah differentiated, which is just 3. And we get this. And then, as before, we want to find dy over dx. So we reciprocate both sides to get 1 over 3, sec 3y, tan 3y. Now we need to get all of this in terms of x. Now certainly that sec 3y we can immediately replace with x. The bigger problem is tan 3y. But we can do this in a very similar way to how we dealt with tan of y when we differentiated that. If 1 plus tan squared of 3y is equal to sec squared of 3y using the identity involving tan and sec again, just as we did before, then we want to make tan of 3y the subject. So tan squared 3y, if you just minus the 1 from that. And then to get tan of 3y, we just square root both sides. And that means we can now write dy over dx. So dy over dx is 1 over 3. The sec 3y we know is x. And then the tan 3y we worked out is the square root of sec squared 3y, which is just x squared minus 1. And there we go.